I have known the next our next guest for quite a long time. We used to work together uh, just about a decade ago, reporting on uh, Wall Street and uh, the uh, shenanigans there in the uh, shenanigans. I sound like Joe Biden, but the malarkey there in the wake of the. Uh, uh, 2008 financial crisis and in the run-up to it as well. He is now, uh, among other things, uh, a senior reporter at HuffPost, where he covers Congress, the White House, and economic policy. Uh, Zachary D. Carter is also the author of a new and fascinating book uh, about uh, John Maynard Keynes, the, uh, the uh, famous and influential economist of the uh, 20th century. His book is entitled The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. And he joins us now. So first of all, Zach Carter, welcome to the Zero Hour. Thanks so much for having me, my old friend. Yeah, good good to talk to you again, old friend. And uh, first of all, congratulations. I'm reading the book now. And uh, I started doing it non-linearly as the uh, as as airtime approached, uh, skipping through. Uh, otherwise, I was reading it straight through. Great read, as well as a lot of uh, great information in it. Uh, but let me start with this: um, What uh, you know, there are a million things we could write a book a uh, book about in this world. Uh, what made you pick John Maynard Keynes? Well, I, I sort of fell into journalism by accident uh, around 2006, and I, I fell into journalism in, in a, a place where I was writing about uh, the banking industry. I was writing for a trade publication in, in central Virginia, uh, and I, I had been a professional musician before this, and I, I just thought uh, the idea of writing about banks was so dreadfully dull and terrible uh, that this was this was just a terrible thing to have happened to me. Uh, given that I had previously been a professional musician and playing on stage and and such, and uh, and and then the global economy imploded because of the banking sector, and it seemed to me like the person who had the most, the theorist at least, who had who had the most plausible explanation for what had gone wrong and what to do about it, was this this dead British economist named John Maynard Keynes, and so. Keynes became very uh, emotionally significant for me because my my career changed as, as a result of the financial crisis. You know, you and I met in Washington uh, when I was when I was working there, and that was you know I was working in Central Virginia before the financial crisis. But the financial crisis, in you know, in, in a, a terrible paradoxical way, you know, made my career, and, and so I started thinking about money and finance in ways that I'd never thought about it before. And uh, and Keynes was just sort of always with me, and I was always going back and reading Keynes while I was, uh, you know, investigating, you know, new, you know, financial frauds and and various things that were happening in the banking sector d during the the crisis and its aftermath. And so I guess from there you decided uh, if you're going to write a book, he's going to be the subject of the book, huh? Uh, you know, you got to follow your passion, and uh, a book is a right. long. It's a long-term project, so this this took me four years. And when I went and talked to an agent about it at the beginning of 2016, he, you know, I had a couple of ideas. I had, I had two or three, and he said, "Look, the one that you obviously care the most about is the John Maynard Keynes project. Let's let's do that." And, and I was like, "Well, do you think it'll sell?" He's like, "Well, you know, you never know what's going to sell, but this is the one you care the most about, so let's do that." And I think that was good advice. You know, and the interesting thing about that story, Zach, is that Keynes himself, in some ways. His meteoric rise uh, was fueled in large pop, part by a book nobody thought would sell or would have guessed would have sold, right? Which was his uh, his take on uh, your book is called The Price of Peace. His take on uh, the economic consequences of the First World War and its ending, and obviously he had a central role in that, which is itself an interesting story of being plucked from obscurity. But he wrote that book, and it was not the kind of thing anyone would have guessed would have been a bestseller, but it was, right? In today's terms, it made him a celebrity. Right. Uh, you know, Keynes's first book was written uh, before the First World, World War, and it was called uh, Indian Currency and Finance. And when you, you call a book Indian Currency and Finance, you don't expect to make a whole lot of money from it, and he didn't. I think it sold uh, less than 1,000 copies. His second book was called The Economic Consequences of the Peace. That is not a title that you decide on when you're trying to get clicks. I can say this is somebody who's worked for the Huffington Post for 10 years. 
Uh, right. It's just not a sexy title. Uh, and yet the book is so trenchant, uh, so so visceral, frankly, uh, that it it and so topical. It was so timely when it came out. Uh, the 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 conventional wisdom uh, about the Treaty of Versailles, the, the 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 peace compact that ended the First World War, before Keynes's book came out, was that this was pretty much a good deal. This was good. Uh, this would set the world on a course for uh, democracy and freedom and stability and peace. And Keynes's book said, no, this is a disaster. Uh, the economic terms of this of this agreement are going to leave everybody in Europe with international debt obligations that are gonna set peoples against each other and set the world up for uh, dictatorship and war. And that very quickly became the new conventional wisdom. Uh, so it sold hundreds of thousands of copies in the United States, which he never expected. Keynes uh, had, had not really understood or enjoyed the company of Americans uh, pr prior to the publication of his book. And, uh, and it, was, it was quite a surprise to him that, it, that, that his reputation took off. But as a result of that book, one of the uh, one of the most aggressive sort of maneuvers he makes in it is is against his own government. He criticizes the British government and says, "What you did at the Treaty of Versailles was a, a crime against the the armistice and and a crime against uh, against international peace." And that gave him the sort of aura of objectivity. It made him totally unwelcome in uh, British government for more than a decade. But it made the rest of the world think that this guy was someone who was a straight shooter. He was going to tell you the truth, even if it was bad for his career, even if it did not reflect well on his own government. And, the, and indeed, the work that he had done over the previous four years, because during the First World War, Keynes was in charge of British war finance for the British Treasury. So he was essentially denouncing everything that he'd done over the past four years in what had been really you know, the greatest calamity uh, that, at least according to Keynes, the world had ever known. Um, so it was a very brave act, uh, but but also one that that came with serious career consequences in uh, in in government, um, but which gave him this sort of sense of of legitimacy for people uh, who were not familiar with finance uh, or or economics. And he also had, you know, the sense uh, I get from my recollections of reading him, and and certainly from your book, Zachary Carter, is uh, he had the gift. Uh, which later John Get Kenneth Galbraith had, uh, which, you know, whatever you think of him, Paul Krugman has, that gift uh, of being an economist where he was trained as a mathematician, but an economist, someone who can write about economics from the inside, but with, uh, but eloquently and with a strong moral voice, right? I mean, he was almost pre 20th century in his fusion of politics and economics and morality. And I suspect that's what gave, uh, led his book to have such an impact when it was published. Is that more or less right, you think? I think so. I, you know, I think it's, it's kind of a mistake to think about Keynes as an economist, really. Uh, he, he was, mm -hmm. of course, a great economist, maybe the greatest economist who ever lived. But uh, he's, he's this broader intellectual. He's concerned with the philosophical foundations of economics. And a lot of economists do very great, important work uh, dealing with a set of assumptions and, and studying a particular sector or a particular industry, a particular problem. Keynes was thinking about how the world works and what the meaning of life is. And he was doing that all the time. His, his best friends were not other economists. They were, they were these artists and, and esthetes in the, the set neighborhood of Bloomsbury in London. And these are people like Virginia Woolf or E.M. Forster, great novelists, great artists, uh, people who are part of this sort of international community of art and letters. And, and Keynes always feels a little bit, uh, he, he feels like he can't quite live up to their example. Like they're, they're clearly the great artists and he's this guy who happens to work in treasury and, and is good with numbers. And, and he always feels a little bit embarrassed by this. Uh, but I think he ultimately is able to take their set of values and translate them into the economics profession in a way that I think is actually much more subversive and much more, um, uh, it attacks the foundations of the economics profession in a way that the, the profession, I, th I think, was never really able to, to cope with. The, the version of Keynesian economics that most of us learn in Econ 101 uh, about deficit spending and how governments need to, to build up big debts during a recession in order to counter a, an economic downturn, I think that is uh, 
a very narrow read of what Keynes was after during his life. He really wanted to create a particular type of world with a particular type of values, and in particular during his lifetime, after the after the Treaty of Versailles and the disastrous ending to World War I, he wanted to prevent a second world war. So he that's why I called the book The Price of Peace. He's trying to use economic policy as a tool to uh, to eliminate international conflict. And and ultimately, in his lifetime, he fails. But over time, I think a lot of his ideas have come to be accepted uh, by by reasonable people as as effective tools against uh, uh, against war. And again, we're talking with Zachary D. Carter, author of the new book, The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. There's an interesting, well, there are a lot of interesting quotes in the book, but one of the, one of the quotes that uh, caught my eye, if I can, I had it right here, damn it. Okay, uh, is, uh, I'm trying to, okay. Uh, if militarists were to prevail, Keynes told his readers, quote, sooner or later, an economic disease spreads, which ends in some variant of the delirium tremens of, of revolution, quote. And so uh, your comment there, the great, uh, the great threat facing liberalism was not socialism, but the thirst for military domination, which is not to say that Keynes was a socialist, but that his his fear of military uh, domination seems to me that his theories, to the extent they've been, the limited extent to which they've been put into practice, may have mitigated that somewhat, but we still live in a world threatened by military domination, don't we? Certainly, and I think uh, you know, th that quote is from, uh, I believe, 1922, when he was at a conference in, in Genoa, which was supposed to sort of um, rethink what had happened in the Treaty of Versailles and reset the economic balance between the different powers of Europe and also the United States, but the United States set that conference, just decided not to join that conference. So what Keynes is talking about there is the, the break between enlightenment liberalism, which he thinks of as this very broad community of political ideas, uh, going back centuries, and and a, a threat to Enlightenment liberalism that is approaching right now. And he says, look, you guys are worried about socialism as this terrible thing that's going to destroy all of our liberal values. And I'm here to say socialism is, is actually part of the, li the liberal family. I'm not saying I'm cool with the socialists. I'm not saying the Soviets are right about stuff, because, of course, the Soviet revolution had just happened, the Bolshevik revolution. And uh, but but what he's really worried about is this this sort of threat of what we would now call uh, right wing or reactionary revolution, and and he's particularly concerned about things that are happening in Italy, in Germany, that the that if you if you deprive people of the economic sustenance for uh, not just survival but 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 for a sort of sense of dignity, um, that they will blame outsiders, and particularly if you deprive them of that uh, economic dignity with uh, a set of international obligations, they're gonna blame the people who they owe the money to. So he says, look, this treaty is setting us up for another war. These people are gonna blame outsiders and we're gonna have this right-wing ultra-nationalist reaction to this treaty. And we're gonna see the same thing we just saw happen in World War I all over again. And uh, I, I think that's, that, you know, it was, it was a really prescient uh, psychological insight. I don't think it's necessarily a left or a right-wing insight. I don't think it's centrist or moderate or socialist or liberal or, or, or you know, any, any of the categories that we would use to describe today's political debate. It's, it's just, it's, it's just a, you know, a pretty reasonable observation about how people, how people behave. And ultimately, I think, uh, I, I think it was unfortunately borne out to be true. And again, Zachary Carter, uh, if you see the world, and, and I tend to agree with that observation as well, as well as with yours, that it's neither inherently left and a right, it's just a description of the world. But if you see the world is suspended between these, these simplistically, between these forces of militarism, nationalist militarism on the one hand, and uh, enlightenment liberalism on the other, then eventually that gets you, I would think almost leads you uh, toward uh, Keynes's economic views because he existed he came to this realization in a world 
that was keyed to the a uh, lock to the gold standard, and therefore debt was not uh, could not be handled in a flexible way. Governments had limited ability to deal with it. So on the one hand, the debt obligations of a country like Germany after the First World War created social pressures that could lead to militarism. But also, uh, I think one of the things you're saying in this book, I think one of the lessons of Keynes learned was that under that economic system, one of the few ways a company could generate economic, a country rather, could generate economic activity might be uh, through building up the military, military action. Is that right? Is that oversimplification? Is that off the mark? Well, when when Keynes was working for the British Treasury during uh, the First World War, I mean, he saw very clearly that that countries could uh, build up their economic output and and employ people by uh, by running a war machine, and that's what the British government did during during World War One. So he was he was keenly aware that it was possible to use government power to use the state uh, to end these economic miseries, but he did not like the way that the British government had chosen to do that during the First World War. He, he thought, well, look, if we can do this during wartime, then surely we can do this during peacetime. Why, why don't we just build roads and bridges and public works and houses? And you know, we, we have all of these social problems that need to be solved that someone needs to spend some money on, and the private sector doesn't seem to be spending money on it. So let's, let's do that. And that, that was an intuition that he had long before he formalized all of this into his magnum opus the general theory of employment, interest, and money, which came out in 1936. That that book, uh, one of the most important works of economic theory that's ever been published, uh, but it it was formalizing a set of ideas and intuitions that he had been advocating for in public life for quite some time uh, before before the book came out. And and after it comes out, it becomes sort of a a, a, a tool that people can use to legitimize these programs. Uh, but but you know one of the ironies of his life is that he he's enormously influential in death. But during his lifetime, uh, there are very very few policy disputes in which he can claim victory, uh, and and the world just keeps getting worse and worse uh, as as it's ignoring his advice. And that of course eventually, uh, not long after the publication of that book, leads to World War II. And uh, one of the reasons why perhaps the thought of John Maynard Keynes is, needs to be revisited in this moment is uh, one of his books that I, I don't even think it's in publication now or has been for a long time, but his, his short <clears throat> book on uh, how to pay for the war, which he wrote for Great Britain, uh, basically, uh, I hear people talking about it again in the context first before the pandemic of a Green New Deal, perhaps, or some other major social reconstruction programs. But now I would assume with the added weight of the pandemic that uh, uh, people may be revisiting that sort of less well-remembered aspect of Keynes's uh, thinking now. But what do you think about that? I mean, obviously you finished your book well before the pandemic or even before the, the major push for the Green New Deal. But what, what do you think? Where does uh, how to pay for the war fit into all of this? I think one of the problems with Keynes is that his legacy has been written by uh, the economics profession. So the, the piece uh, of, of his uh, over that the economics profession has decided to latch onto is, is the, the general theory. And then they've taken a particularly narrow read of the general theory and said, this is Keynesianism. Um, How to Pay for the War is a really brilliant piece. It's published in 1940, um, and it's published uh, in, in these magazines, but also in Hogarth Press, which is this independent publisher run by Virginia and Leonard Wolf. And uh, it, it, it essentially argues that the problem facing an economy at war is not a problem of dollars and debts. It's not, it's not a, a numerical problem. It's a problem of real resources. How much stuff do we have in this society that we can dedicate to the war effort and then defeating and clothing people at home? And so if you reach the actual real resource limits of the production of the economy, then you start running into all sorts of problems that uh, the economy in ordinary times can't reach because the fact is we're often not at the real the, the limits 
of our productive capacity. But once you get to that productive capacity, then you do have to start making uh, what I think Keynes would call some hard choices. And one of the things he talks about is, you know, if we're going to finance the war with sort of future obligations, promises to repay on investments in the present day, it matters how those investments are distributed after the war. So if you rely exclusively on government bonds to finance your war effort, that means that you're going to be relying overwhelmingly on financial investors, people with lots of money currently. And that means people who currently have lots of money are going to get the biggest payout from this investment after the war when it's over. So he suggests an alternative. He says, look, why don't we just defer some of the pay that we would ordinarily give to, to every worker? No, no one likes this. No one likes getting a pay cut. Uh, but since we're up against the real resource limits of the economy, let's defer some of their pay until after the war and give them an upside in, uh, in, in the payout, the investment in, in, in victory. The, the point there is that it, it's really not about paying for the war in this financial sense. It's about paying for the war in a how do we get society to mobilize for this? And then what do we care, what kind of society we want to live in afterwards? What do we want it to look at, look like on the other end? It's about values. And there's, there's a moral and an aesthetic uh, uh, argument that he is making in that, in that piece. And I think the economics profession has worked very hard to strip itself of, of the moral content to right. its, uh, you know, to its evaluations, and and I think Keynes just would would not have believed that that was possible. Sure, sure, there are mathematics, there are equations, uh, and and the like, but uh, you can't smuggle in your values to these equations and pretend the values aren't there. So it's better to uh, to to go about this with with a, as as a sort of small d Democrat and think about the way we want the economy. To, to function and who we want it to benefit and who we want it to reward. Uh, because those are questions that the market ultimately is, is not a, a fair arbiter of uh, if, you, uh, if, you, if you take just the sort of sum total of people's consumer preferences in, in the marketplace. And again, we're talking with Zachary D. Carter, whose new book is The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy, and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. So if you take something like uh, How to Pay for the War, gets popularly published, has you know, I I would say you know as as its two main ideas, at least the two I remember, that one that uh, you're we're going to run out of stuff. That's the resource limit. We're going to need a lot of stuff for the war. That means one way or another, uh, we probably have to discourage people from using a lot of stuff themselves. One way to do it is by paying working people less but you got to pay off at the end. So the advantage for you is if you go along with it, uh, you know, you'll be rewarded uh, in the future. And, um, but by putting it out the way he did, he was saying in effect to the people of Great Britain, what do you think? Um, and that's the part you're talking about, the small d uh, democracy piece of it. Um, let's talk, about, if, if we can, about I don't want to say the afterlife of Keynes, although you know he did die relatively young at what sixty two I think but um, but what has certainly been the afterlife uh, since his death, which is even in the United States where uh, I guess it was Nixon who said we're all Keynesians now, um, and Nixon of course took us off the gold standard with a move a lot of people associated with Keynes um, and Keynes is thinking um, but even uh, though he got intellectual acceptance, even though some democratic thinkers in particular uh, swore allegiance to him and there were new neo-Keynesians and so on, it's a point you make in the book that I think is right is that it's a kind of um, bloodless Keynesianism. It's stripped of the morality, it's stripped of the passion, it's stripped of the context and more kind of retrofitted, uh, this is what I, I would say, but you know, I want your thoughts, obviously, to the kind of technocratic image that economics tried to present for itself, and therefore is not, not only not a reflection of Keynes as a full personality, but not even a re reflection of his uh, 
economic thinking either. What do you think? Am I getting it sort of right? Well, I think by the 1960s uh, and and the, the the Kennedy and Johnson administrations, which are sort of the the high era of Keynesian economics as something that 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 is is respected and even revered, I think in in Washington. Um, this is this is just the way the world works. It's it's clearly Keynesian. Uh, by that point in time, it, it's become this sort of bloodless, as you say, uh, science where you spend a dollar on war, you spend a dollar on art. Uh, either way, that's going to boost GDP by one dollar. So the role of the government in economic policy is to lift GDP, but not necessarily. According to uh, many economists, think that it's that it's sort of uh, imposing their own values, or it's an act of hubris or arrogance to say what the government should spend its money on. Uh, and this is a real problem in the Vietnam War era, because, of course, there, there are people within the, the Kennedy and Johnson administrations who disagree about the Vietnam War. One of them, very prominently, is, is John Kenneth Galbraith, who is a deeply committed Keynesian, uh, wants to spend a lot of money in order to uh, keep the economy roaring but has no interest in maintaining the war in Vietnam, wants to end it uh, very badly, while other economists in, in, the, uh, in the administration just sort of may agree with him privately, but, but decide not to make a fuss within the administration. So the way that Keynesianism is interpreted, he becomes this sort of historical idol that you can hold up to justify particular uh, economic approaches. Um, and if you can claim the mantle of Keynesianism for your your policy advice, uh, that that becomes the sort of uh, legitimizing thing that that helps it get through the corridors of power in Washington. And this ends up being a real problem because, of course, uh, you you eventually uh, it, by the by the end of the Johnson administration um, start start having some problems with inflation in particular, uh, which people at the time believe is is uh, at least partially a result of the enormous war spending that's going on. In Vietnam, uh, so th there is a disconnect between uh, the type of economics that Keynes tried to practice, which was a a very uh, vibrant, full-blooded uh, sort of ethical practice, a, a, a type of philosophy um, about how the world ought to work, um, and the very scientific, technocratic uh, kind of you know tweaking the dials and adjusting the meters. Uh, sort of uh, idea of economics that becomes practiced by the 1960s. But I think it's important to remember Keynes would probably not be remembered today had the, you know, technocratic, you know, dial twiddlers not ultimately um, been able to uh, triumph in that, in that particular period. Um, they did get very good results for economic growth uh, and for poverty reduction and 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 the like, even for inequality reduction into the 1960s, um, across racial lines included. Um, so if that had not happened, people never would have talked about Keynes. He would have been some guy from the British government who got overruled all the time uh, during his lifetime and and then died. <laughs> and, uh, and instead, he's he's one of the great figures of the 20th century. But I, it sounds like uh, there's a certain irony into that because he's widely remembered as a great figure, but not for what he cared about the most. More, it, it, it's as if he, you know, invented, uh, a, you know, a great pasta dish and uh, invented a pasta maker to go along with it. But people just remember the pasta maker and not the dish that he made. Yeah, I, bad analogy, but you know what I'm trying to say that. No, no, no. He never, he never wanted to be remembered as this guy who was a deficit twiddler, right? Like he, 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 he didn't wake up every day and say, like, how can I convince countries to run up deficits during recessions? But that's right. what we all learned about him. He wanted, he woke up every day and said, how do we stop war? How do we stop international conflict? How do we keep peoples from, 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 from fighting with each other? And, and that part of his, of his legacy is just gone. Uh, I mean, I hope to revive it with this book, but I think that's, that's the important part. And and you have to be careful here because you know I have a very high regard for Keynes. I yeah I, I don't think my book is like a takedown of him or anything. But but there are limits to what you can achieve with economic policy. And I think in a lot of ways the legacy of Keynesian economics, even when it's been practiced uh, to the fullest, shows that 
uh, that in, in certain important respects, he was he was quite naive about what the power of economic policy was to uh, eliminate human conflict. Um, but that said, I think there there are there are quite a few uh, arenas in which it's it's very effective, and and we haven't we haven't used them enough over the past century. And I got I, I was just trying to look for it while we were talking, Zach Carter, but it was uh, I got an email. I think it was from uh, Jacobin for uh, a video conference that I couldn't, you know, I didn't, wasn't able to watch, but the, and, and maybe the, uh, it was something like, we have to talk about a complicated relationship, John Maynard Keynes and the left. And, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I assume what they're talking about is that if you're a socialist, Keynes is not he's a semi-ally but not really because he still functions in a world that does not assume a hundred percent planned economy i mean i'm guessing that's what they're uh, but on the other hand it's not an entirely adversarial relationship because he does offer an argument for a larger role uh for government in in creating a, a humane way of life and arguably was uh, his ideas helped reinforce the social welfare state in Western Europe or whatever, but he's, he's definitely not quote unquote a leftist. What are your thoughts on that? Well, look, uh, I, I haven't seen that, uh, that, that exchange and, and I should be clear that I have a lot of respect for a lot of people who write for Jacobin. Me um, too. Uh, but, it's not about but, that. Yeah. Yeah. But but I but I also uh, you know I also think that this debate over capitalism versus socialism is 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 kind of a silly semantic debate and it's something that uh, a lot of publications on the left have been fueling and I I don't really understand what the the the, the function here is uh, politically you know Keynes it's true uh, that he comes from the British elite uh, in in a certain sense you know he he's you know. A Cambridge intellectual. He works in in in, in the British Treasury. Um, you know, he hangs out with all of these very fancy people, uh, and and he he mostly wants to recreate the sort of uh, fancy lifestyle that people in the British leisure class have, and, and make that accessible to everybody. Um, whether that you want to call that socialism or or managed capitalism or uh, or capitalism, I, I I think that's a semantic debate that doesn't doesn't matter a whole lot. I, I do think in his worldview, though, he doesn't fit contemporary political debates cleanly. You know, he's somebody who is totally comfortable hanging out with Winston Churchill. They are friends. They get along. They, they, they work together politically in multiple administrations. Uh, he's, he's totally averse to the idea of revolution. I think if, if he saw the rhetoric in the Bernie Sanders uh, campaign in 2020, for instance, he would have just been appalled. But he is also somebody who was the financial architect for socializing British medicine. I mean, right. you would not have the National Health Service in Britain today had John Maynard Keynes uh, not gone to bat for it, not run the numbers, um, not helped steward it through Parliament. Uh, he he became a, a, a by by the end of World War II, he was somebody who was a, a figure of high prestige in British politics, and so he uses his prestige to help socialize British medicine. So I think it's it's a mistake to think of him as somebody who is who is saving capitalism uh, from its worst instincts uh, and and you know making uh, you know a bad system more uh, uh, more humane um, if if you're t approaching it from the left and I think if you're approaching it from the right you know it, it's a mistake to think of him as a as a rabid socialist who just wants to nationalize everything um, he doesn't want to nationalize everything he wants. He wants everybody to live the way the elite live. That's what he cares about most of all. And the policy tools for how you get there, that he uh, he's very flexible on. Uh, it just it just sort of depends on the sector and the time and the the issues at stake. So, you know, sure he supported deficit spending uh, during economic downturns because it became very clear that that would be an effective way to keep people from becoming immiserated. Um, but he didn't just want to keep people from being immiserated. He wanted them all to enjoy the Bloomsbury good life that uh, that he enjoyed as uh, as one of London's elites. And he wrote about that. And you uh, very early on, you quoted it was a, 
uh, very eloquent writing on his part. So uh, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. But I do encourage people to uh, get the book, buy it and read it. I'm enjoying it. The book is uh, The Price of Peace, Money, Democracy and the Life of John Maynard Keynes. Zachary D. Carter is the author. Zach, great talking to you. And thanks for coming on the program. Great to talk to you, my friend.